So my name is Laura Payton. Um, for those of you who haven't met me before, I'm a senior associate solicitor at Redouts. And I'll be hosting the webinar today. Um, my colleague Gemma will be talking about mandatory vaccinations on um, quite an important day for that when the legislation comes into force or the date for um, all care staff to be mandatory, mandatorily vaccinated. Um, Paul will be talking about potential changes to adult social care funding. Um, the webinar is down for roughly 45 minutes um, to include some time for questions. We'll take questions for both panellists at the end, if that's all right. If I could ask that you put your questions in the question and answer box, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen, hopefully, so not the chat function if possible, um, please in the question and answer box. And one of the most popular questions we always get is, will you be sharing the slides after the webinar? So I'll answer that now for you. The answer is yes, we'll share the slides as well as a video of the webinar shortly after. And it will also be available on our website um, within about a week or so as well. Um, as I say, we've got about 45 minutes, including questions. And I'll just make sure, given it's the 11th of November, that we're, we're finished well in good time for those that are observing um, silence at 11 o'clock. So without further ado, I will pass you on to my colleague, Gemma, who's going to talk about mandatory vaccines and CQC's monitoring approach. Thank you, Laura. Good morning, everyone. So as Laura says, I'm going to be covering mandatory vaccinations and CQC's monitoring approach. Next slide, please, Laura. So I'm going to cover the change in legislation, what all of this means for providers in terms of logistics. I'm going to briefly cover the operational guidance published by the Department of Health and Social Care and I will discuss the subject of CQC monitoring. Next slide, please. So as you know, in the spring, the government consulted to change the law so that care homes can only deploy staff who have received two doses of the COVID-19 vaccination. The key dates are shown on the slide. However, all those dates are in the past um, because those working in care homes have been given a 16 week period to have both doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. And as Laura mentioned, today marks the end of that grace period, because today is the date that the new regulations comes into force. You would have also have heard that the government has recently consulted on making coronavirus vaccinations and flu vaccinations compulsory in the wider health and social care sector. And that includes supported living and domiciliary care services. The consultation closed on the 22nd of October, and this week the government announced its decision that COVID-19 vaccinations, note not flu vaccinations, will be mandatory for NHS staff from the 1st of April 2022. Next slide, please. So the reason for the change in law stems from the scientific advisory group for emergencies advice that vaccine rates of 80% in staff and 90% in residents in each care home setting would be needed to provide a minimum level of protection against coronavirus outbreaks. At the time of proposing the regulations, only 65% of care homes in England met that threshold and the proportion was only 44% of care homes in London. Next slide, please. So who does the rule apply to? Whilst the consultation originally proposed that the rules would only apply to care homes with residents aged 65 and over, the new regulations applies to all CQC registered care homes providing the regulated activity of accommodation for persons who require nursing or personal care. And the rule applies to anyone coming to the care home in a work capacity as listed on the slide. The rule does not solely apply to care home staff, but also volunteers, visiting professionals and tradespeople. This must be stressed as the Department of Health and Social Care has received feedback that some visiting professionals are not aware of the requirement to be fully vaccinated by today. As a result, the department has written a reminder letter to visiting professionals. It's in your interest as well to also remind visiting professionals or, or professionals visiting your services about the rule in order to avoid challenging situations after today. Next slide, please. So I'll briefly um, go through the legislation. The Health and Social Care Act 2008 Regulated Activities Amendment Coronavirus Regulations 2021 amends the Health and Social Care Act 2008 Regulated Activities Regulations 2014, which you will be familiar with. 
and inserts the requirement as a new provision in the fundamental standards in part three of the regulations. Regulations 12, regulation 12, which deals with safe care and treatment will be added to, specifically regulation 12.2H, which states that in order for a provider or registered manager to provide care and treatment in a safe way for service users, they must assess the risk of and prevent, detect and control the spread of infections, including those that are healthcare associated. So new paragraphs will be added to the end of regulation 12, which effectively set out the exceptions and exemptions to the rule of mandatory vaccinations. Next slide, please. So there is a difference between exceptions and exemptions. There will be exceptions for visiting family and friends, under 18s, emergency services, people undertaking urgent maintenance work or providing emergency assistance. Next slide, please. Only staff with a prescribed medical exemption are not required to be fully vaccinated. According to the consultation and outcome publication, a small number of people will fit into this category. Detailed guidance has been promised, which we have been told will reflect the Green Book on Immunisation Against Infectious Disease and clinical advice from the Joint Committee of Vaccination and Immunisation. However, on the 15th of September, the Director of Adult Social Care Delivery wrote to all care home providers and managers stating that on a temporary basis, care home workers who have a medical reason why they are unable to have a COVID-19 vaccine will be able to self-certify that they meet the medical exemption using template forms which were attached to the letter. Note, there are two forms, one for medical exemptions and another for individuals vaccinated abroad to self-certify as medically exempt. Providers should insist that staff use the government self-certification form and not their own form or wording. The government form includes wording, giving providers some recourse should false information be provided. The letter from the director provides a non-exhaustive list of examples of medical exemptions, which I summarise on the slide. Time limited exemptions will also be available for those with short term medical conditions, for example, people receiving hospital care or receiving medication which may interact with the vaccination. I also understand that there is a helpline to help people confirm if their proposed exemption is legitimate. Next slide, please. Then on the 11th of October, the Director of Adult Social Care Delivery again wrote to all care home providers and managers advising of the formal COVID-19 medical exemption that was introduced on the 1st of October. So from the 1st of October, individuals working or volunteering in care homes could apply for a formal COVID-19 medical exemption by calling 119 and requesting an NHS COVID pass medical exemption form. The possible reasons for exemptions are identical to those that exist for the temporary process, which were set out in my previous slide. Each application will be clinically reviewed by a doctor, spe specialist clinician or midwife, and results will be automatically posted two to three weeks after the application. I understand applicants can then use the NHS COVID pass. Please note the clinical decision on medical exemption is final. The decision cannot be appealed. So with the introduction of the formal system, the temporary self-certification system expires on the 24th of December. So anyone who has self-certified as exempt on medical grounds will have to obtain confirmation of this exemption through the formal process by no later than Friday the 24th of December. Next slide, please. In terms of logistics, providers should by now have updated policies and procedures, included a vaccination clause in contracts with external suppliers if necessary, and adapted recruitment processes. Most importantly, you should have by now established a system for checking and recording the vaccination, of the vaccination or exemption status of those coming into the care home. I have seen that apps are on the market to assist providers with this function. Note here, evidence of vaccination is considered to be the NHS app, proof via the NHS website and the NHS COVID pass letter. A person's vaccination appointment card is not evidence or proof of vaccination. 
Evidence in compliance to the CQC is another practicality. I will talk about the CQC in a moment, but firstly, I'll briefly touch upon HR issues. I have previously advised that providers should inform staff about the new regulations and find out which staff will be having the vaccine, but we have now passed that stage. Providers should already know the approach that will be taken for late vaxxers. Avoid dismissing those that intend, intend on getting the vaccine, but have not managed to get it done before the deadline. The approach taken may be to allow those staff to take a crude holiday or have paid or unpaid leave. Then there is the approach to be taken for vaccine refusers. Follow a procedure which includes meeting with the member of staff. If you have to, dis if you have to dismiss staff, three key takeaways. Employers must act reasonably, employers must follow a fair procedure, and the decision to dismiss must be a reasonable response. Also note, employees with at least two years continuous service have unfair dismissal rights. Employees, regardless of time served, can bring a, a discrimination claim sorry, under the Equality Act 2010 and medical exemptions are likely to meet the criteria of having a disability under the Equality Act. I reiterate, only medical exemptions apply. Exemptions do not include religious beliefs, other beliefs such as anti-vaccination beliefs and political views. If providers have staff who are medically exempt, note medical exemption is not an elimination of risk. Providers still need to ensure PPE is readily available, risk assessments are kept up to date, and possible change of duties or redeployment is considered. Next slide, please. The Department of Health and Social Care has produced operational guidance to support the implementation of the new regulations. Providers should read the full guidance. It is a good source of information on how to comply with the regulations. It is helpfully set out in sections for the registered provider or manager, for staff, friends and family and visiting professionals, and it includes some scenarios. It provides details on the exceptions I referred to earlier, and it also provides practical points such as how the rule applies to those entering a care home for a job interview, for example. There is also helpful advice on how to record people's vaccination or exemption status. I've put a link to the guidance on the slide and also links to some FAQ documents, which you may find useful. I'm sorry about the blinding colour of the links. Next slide, please. The requirement for those working in a care home to be vaccinated will be monitored and enforced by the CQC. Most importantly, the CQC will start its monitoring of it of this from today. So they haven't started monitoring already, so they say. The CQC will be using its existing assessment and enforcement processes and will not be using a new regime to monitor and enforce this new regulation. The CQC has said it will not be prescriptive about the systems and processes in a service to comply with the regulations. On the 4th of August, the CQC published a statement on its role in monitoring vaccinations as a condition of deployment. The statement is not hugely detailed, but it does provide an outline of the approach that the CQC will take in relation to the registration process, its ongoing monitoring and inspection of care homes and enforcement. Next slide, please. In relation to registration, the CQC will be seeking assurances from providers that their services have robust systems in place to monitor vaccinations of staff and those entering the home, um, sorry, that it has robust systems in place to monitor vaccinations of staff and those entering into the home, and that staff maintain the best infection prevention control practices. Next slide, please. Also, in relation to registration, the CQC will seek assurances from new managers that they as individuals are fully vaccinated or exempt and that they are aware of their duties under the new regulation. Next slide, please. So in relation to ongoing monitoring and inspection, an additional question will be added to the provider information returns relating to vaccinations. 
The question that has been added is, how are you assured that those you employ and deploy within your service are vaccinated in line with government requirements? The CQC will also build a similar question into its monitoring approach. Where they have information of concern through any source, the CQC will follow this up. This may include seeking assurances from the provider or carrying out an on-site inspection. One of their sources for monitoring care home compliance with the new regulation will be the capacity tracker. Therefore, providers should ensure their data on the capacity tracker is up to date. Also, providers will not need to show inspectors the evidence of vaccination or exemption itself but rather evidence that it has been viewed by the service, so effectively evidence of the systems and processes in place to ensure individuals who enter the premises are fully vaccinated or exempt. Providers may choose to record um, or, or to keep a record of the evidence for their own internal staff employment record keeping. If the evidence that is collected is and is recorded and stored, all personal data must be handled in accordance with UK GDPR. It is worth noting that CQC inspectors are included within the scope of visiting professionals for the purposes of the new regulation. Compliance with the regulations would be an appropriate reason for not granting access to an inspector. Next slide, please. In relation to enforcement, the CQC has said that any enforcement activity will be undertaken on a proportionate basis. In terms of what that means in practice, Kate Taroni, Chief Inspector of Adult Social Care, has said that this means the CQC will look at the level of staff vaccinated in a home in the round, taking into account the overall service provided. The CQC can use its civil and criminal enforcement powers, but based on comments made by Kate and Alison Murray, Head of Inspection, civil enforcement action will be more frequently used for breaches in this area. This includes requirement notices, warning notices and conditions. Criminal enforcement action, such as fixed penalty notices and prosecutions, would be in rare cases and form part of wider concerns about the service. Next slide, please. In conclusion, the regulations come into force today. Only staff with a prescribed medical exemption are not required to be fully vaccinated. If someone has a temporary self-certified exemption, this runs out on the 24th of December. And at that point, they must be fully vaccinated or medically exempt, having used the formal clinically reviewed medical exemption process. I also touched upon the logistics of applying the new law to existing staff, new recruits and visiting professionals. Providers should already have made relevant changes to their policies, procedures, recruitment processes and contracts. And if you haven't already done so, take a read of the operational guidance and CQC statement on its monitoring role. That's all from me. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks. For that Gemma, that's really timely reminders um, of what providers need to do to ensure that they are compliant with the changes in relation to mandatory vaccines, so thanks for that. Um, I've noticed that during the course of your presentation Gemma, um, we had a number of new participants join the webinar, so just very quickly welcome to those people who have just joined. We will take questions as a panel at the end of Paul's presentation, which we are about to do in a second. Um, but can I ask please that if you have any questions, can you please pop them in the question and answer box, not the chat box? So they're just next to each other. If you pop your questions in the Q&A, we'll try and get through as many as we can today. But alternatively, we can try and answer some of them offline um, via our website. And just to repeat, the, the slides will be shared at the end of the, uh, after the webinar, and the video will also be shared and will be available on our website. So our next speaker today is the Managing Director of Redout, Paul Redout. He's going to speak to us about another hot topic that's been widely discussed over recent months, which is the proposals for adult social care funding reform. So I see he's unmuted and ready to go. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Paul. Thank you, Laura. Morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And um, 
I am going to talk to you about the announced government announced proposals to reform funding. And really, this is all a bit of a non-event for care providers. It has significant effect for those who use care services and potentially for local authorities. And we'll touch on that in a minute. But for, for providers, things have not changed and will not change very much. Now, it's important to take into account immediately that the reforms affect publicly commissioned, publicly funded care. They do not affect in any way private pay um, arrangements where um, privately or voluntarily third party support is in place and they do not apply to care funded by the NHS. And so it's purely local authority funded care and it's addressing those items that people are concerned about. Now, many of you may get private pay and third party support approach and people may think that what's coming up, the cap on, on, on personal care fees applies in the private pay sector. There's no indication that it does, no intention that it should. So those of you that are engaged with direct payment from private customers, or private patients, private um, clients, will not be affected. And they will not, as I see it, get the benefit of the uh, cap on care charges. They, it's local authority funding and it's focused on clients. And what is concerning to me and to many is that government have, have given complete trust and confidence to the local authorities to manage this and implement the policy. The extra funding, which is going to be generated primarily to the NHS and then to social care through the new uh, levy or through the national um, insurance charge and through ultimately the, uh, the care levy that's coming in 2023 are not ring fenced or as the experts say, hypothecated. So when the local authority receives that money, they will not be obliged to spend it in a particular way. It will be as it is now within their discretion. And that is a cause of concern because local authorities may well not flow down as much money as is expected through the process to the front line where care is needed so as to enable staff to be extra remunerated, extra trained, whatever it is, local authorities will apply when they get the funds, whatever they are, to their own policies and procedures and priorities. Next slide, please. So all the usual rules apply. The rates that will be paid for public funding are the local authority rates, which most of you will be currently negotiating through your care associations or individual direct contacts with the local authorities who are responsible for funding service users within your care. And that will include the same provisions that apply now in relation to the so-called top-ups or the third party contribution or those situations where an individual's circumstances and means allow temporary disregards. All of those apply to the individual contract between the local authority and the the individual commissioning arrangements between the local authority and the individual service user. Um, so there will still be a provision for third party contributions to be made to increase fees where there is, is suitable cover from um, the third party to meet the difference between the local authority estimated cost of care and the care that the care home actually provides. Again, here, that what we're coming to discuss in a minute, the cap on care will apply to, to, to um, third party contributions um, as it is assessed in the individual's need to um, contribute to the local authority funding in due course. Next slide, please. Now, really important because it's not being clearly published. Uh, the cap on care, which has been introduced eventually following the much delayed Dilnot re report is only in relation to the costs of personal care. Now, care home providers, care and care says, do not break down their fees into different elements. We've seen this arising over the last 15, 20 years with what was called the registered nursing care contribution and now funded nursing care. That is a contribution to the element of nursing care. The personal care element, which will 
be assessed in a way which is not yet clear is the only item which will apply for the cap on costs. So it doesn't apply to accommodation charges, it doesn't apply to food charges, it doesn't apply to diversional um, therapy or hobby activities. And so that there is a certain amount of an illusion around this. The costs of the, the cap on costs currently predicted at somewhere in excess of £80,000 is most unlikely to be met in most local authority funded cases until people have been in residential care for a very significant period of time. Um, and as one calculates, guessing the rates of personal care that will be assessed, maybe three, four, five years. So the idea that there is going to be a cap on costs of care of people believing that if they spend £80,000, then they will get all the services supportive going forward, will not apply. And there's going to be great disappointment about this. As soon as this is raised and challenged, everybody in government, everybody in local authorities agree with this approach. But I don't think it's getting through the press to the public. So you need to be aware of that when people talk to you about that. There's still going to be an obligation to meet contributions to the local authority funding if, you're me if the means of the service user are appropriate. Next slide, please, Laura. Yeah, so they've, they've changed the contribution levels. This is the levels. There will be no contribution, as I understand it, where people have assets up to £20,000. There will be a contribution, as there is now, where those assets are between £20,000 and £100,000. And there will be, um, it says no contribution, but there, there will be no um, limit on the total contribution when assets are above 100. So sorry for that um, error in the slide. Once you have more than £100,000, you will have to pay to the local authority the whole of the cost that they are providing, subject, of course, to your possibly having met the cap. And I'm, when I say you, I'm talking about the client service user. Um, next slide, please. That's really a, a simple run through of the background. And to say that from a provider's point of view, this has very little impact on what you do. You need to understand so that you can explain to your service users, to your clients, to your residents, how it may affect their ongoing funding and their contributions to care. But a lot will still depend upon their individual means and their um, ability to meet those contributions going forward. So probably from a care home provider, important to note, but not of significant day-to-day -day approach. Thank you very much. And now it's time for questions, if there are any. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for that presentation. And yeah, that does bring us on to the question and answer session. Um, as I've mentioned, we'll address these as a panel. At the moment, a number of them seem to relate to mandatory vaccination. So I'll also ask, I'll maybe ask Paul to chip in as well so that um, we're not putting too much pressure on Gemma. But actually, there, there is one question, Paul, arising out of your presentation. And you've said that it's not got much practical significance um, at the moment. But is there is there anything that providers can do to prepare sort of contractually or anything like that? You're still on mute, so you're just going to have to come off so you can answer that. But so yeah, in summary, that's you. In summary, it, what can providers do practically in terms of reviewing? Is it time to review contracts or anything like that? Well, I, I, yes, providers can look at their contracts. The important thing to look at, as we have advised people with the funded with the funded nursing care contribution, the important thing to look at very carefully is how you structure the contract to make sure that you still receive your complete and entire fee even if you are receiving elements of that fee from other sources, whether it be through third party top ups, whether it be through private contribution, whether it be through the NHS, whether it be through funded nursing care or uh, and how it may impact as the cap is reached in a number of years time. So the important thing is to make sure that the fee that you set, whoever is paying it, is an entire fee. And then you have a mechanism to credit back or cash back any contributions that come from other people along the way so that you don't get trapped with a service user or resident or a local authority saying, well, you can't charge that increase, you can't charge that element of the fee because it's covered by this element. And you may even find local authorities 
stepping in and saying, um, our rate for the personal care element is this. If you then take the rate for the personal care element, the rate for the funded care element, what other elements may come to be limited? And we need to be vigilant to make sure that care charges don't effectively become fixed and capped, rather like they did many years ago when there was central government grant funding. So yes, do look at your contracts and make sure that they are flexible enough and well enough drafted to address um, this coming change in, in, in external funding from your customer, the service user, whoever that may be, or the local authority. Thanks for that. Some helpful practical pointers there for providers. A um, couple of questions now in relation to the vaccinations presentation. Um, obviously, everyone knows about their first and second doses of the, the vaccine to be, at the moment, what's described as fully vaccinated. But well, obviously, the government is running, uh, rolling out a programme of booster doses. We've had a question about what, what the situation is with those booster doses, Gemma. Do they fall under any of the regulations or...? No, at, at present, booster doses are not included in the regulations, but um, providers have been advised to encourage workers, to encourage their staff to take up the booster vaccines. But at this stage, there's been no decision to include that in the regulations. Perhaps an ongoing change that we can keep an eye out for. Possibly. All of these things seem to change um, and get updated very, very regularly. So no doubt there'll be forthcoming um, things to look out for. There's been a couple of questions and they're sort of all along the same or her similar theme. Um, and again, it's in relation to mandatory vaccinations and um, the self certification and medical exemptions. So I, I, and really employment questions around these. So what if someone self certifies for a medical exemption and then the GP doesn't sign off their COVID pass? Um, can or should their last working day be the 24th of December? Um, and I think along the same line, someone else has asked, would you advise that care providers should make staff res redundant as of today if they are not fully vaccinated? Um, yeah, so you touched on that a little bit, but perhaps you could explain. Sure. I mean, the law, the law is clear of the date um, at which the regulations are in force. So as of today, um, you know, nobody entering the threshold should not have had a vaccine. Um, so we've got the list of those that are um, except, ex the exceptions. And obviously the exemptions are those that are medically exempt. But otherwise, um, the law is clear. It, there is, there isn't, you know, they shouldn't cross the threshold. So a provider needs to take action to ensure that they are not breaching the regulation. In relation to the 24th of December, I suppose the same applies. Um, maybe there will be more clarity as, as time goes by. I think the main thing that I've noticed is that we were promised detailed guidance on the exemptions um, originally. So it would reflect the Green Book on, on immunizations and advice from the JCVI. And to date, I haven't seen that. Um, unless I've missed it, what, what we have seen is the letters from the Director of Adult Social Care Delivery, and um, that list is non-exhaustive. I don't think it's very detailed, and I don't know, are the doctors and the clinicians and midwives are going to be using that list? And if it's just that, then, um, and, and it cannot be appealed, then there may be an issue, there may be challenges if a doctor is saying, um, you know, someone who then submits through the formal process, if the doctor refuses that application. Um, so I think things will develop over the next, um, you can't even say couple of months, it's literally the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, a, an unfortunate time when, you know, the 24th of December, you know, around Christmas, when this will kick in. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not helpful at all. But yeah, that's the way it stands. Um, Laura, well, Laura can, I, can I jump in there? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think it's a really important point that people should think with their HR advisors and with their employment lawyers about how they're going to manage the employment process and the termination of employment process. I think it's really a really good point and really sensible that you need to think about when employment is going to terminate because if somebody is non-compliant, they cannot come into the home. Now, just on a technical point, and I hate to be technical on a talk like this, but it's these people are not being made redundant because this is not a situation where there is not work to do. They are 
being sacked, dismissed, because they don't comply with the requirements that allow them to come into and work in the care home. So looking forward, just very simply, if people have self-certified and that they are awaiting for the letter, the exemption letter confirmation that, uh, that Gemma has talked about, then it might be sensible to give some form of notice indicating that failing receipt of that letter by midnight on the 24th of December, how jolly is that, um, their employment will terminate. Because the, the principles about the underlying contract of employment and termination will still apply. So really good thought and really good question from that questioner. You need to be thinking forward with your HR advisors about how you're going to manage that process. If, as we all hope, does not happen, there are people who have been self-certified exempt, but cease to be on the dawn of Christmas Day. Um, it's a pity that day was chosen, but there we are. Yeah, it is unfortunate. Um, sorry to jump around and Paul, just before you mute yourself again, I've had a question in relation to your talk back on funding um, in relation to care and accommodation costs. Um, do you think, would it be reasonable to assume that all wages relating to providing care can be split between all residents in determining care costs as opposed to accommodation costs? Is that a technical one? What was the what was all all what costs can be split? All wages relating to provided care, providing care can they can the costs the wages costs for all of the care be split between all of the residents in determining care costs as opposed to accommodation costs? Well, I think that um, this is, I, I think it's going to be very difficult to split wages. Um, it's it's more that the focus is on the cost to the individual client of the element of the contract that provides personal care to which they are contributing. So when they are contracted through the local authority and they have a local authority contract and they've got means either over a hundred thousand pounds or between 20,000 and a hundred thousand so that they're making contributions, then the local authority will hopefully negotiate, though there's not good track record on that, the local authority will decide what the personal care element of the fee is. They will then, having decided that element, that will be the element to which contribution is made. And when the threshold is reached, then the contribution will reduce. I mean, that's all a bit speculative, but it's, it's going to come from the local authority and negotiations with the local authority, rather than um, the the provider talking to their individual client service users and residents. So I think watch out for that. And I don't think the local authorities have even started to think about that yet, mm -hmm. partly because it's not in law. It's just proposals that have come from the government to implement this, to meet what they describe as the disgraceful and terrible loss of capital by people having to pay for their care home fees, which um, our listeners, some of them may take a different view on that description from government, but that's politics. Like everything else, we're still waiting for a lot more detail on it. And I think just looking at the time, we've probably got time for one more question to each um, presenter. Um, Gemma, I'll go to you first. It's a more practical question back on um, what evidence can providers get from contractors coming to visit services in relation to their vaccination service? It, it, status, sorry. Is there any guidance on what sort of evidence um, providers should be asking for from, say, contractors, people that are coming into, that are perhaps not, you know, health professionals, etc.? Um, I would say first and foremost to look at the operational guidance that the Department of Health and Social Care has produced. It's um, it, you've got the section on visiting professionals. Um, technically, these would be tradespeople, but at the same time, from what I understand, is that it's the evidence itself, so the evidence of the exemption or the vaccination, that more so applies for staff. But again, it's a case of showing that you've seen it. So with those that are not staff members coming through the door, it's having a system of checking it, ticking it off. It could, I've, I've read, you know, it could be just an extra column on a log ticking that it's been seen. Also within the operational guidance, it does say about whether you need to see it multiple times. I think effectively, once you've seen it once and it's someone that regularly comes in, that's fine. You know, you've seen it once, you don't need to keep on seeing it every time they come in. Um, with staff, obviously it's a bit different. Um, as I said in, in my talk, that if you want to keep the information, the evidence that you've looked at, 
if you want to keep that within your internal um, employment records for, for your staff, then just be aware of UK GDPR and um, have a look at the Information Commissioner's website. That gives a lot of information on ensuring that you're keeping and storing that information appropriately. Thanks, um, Gemma, that's helpful. Um, just one final question. I'm actually, it's, it's on mandatory vaccinations, but I'm going to put it to Paul. It's a bit of an interesting question. I don't want to put you on the spot on it, but let's take your, take your views if you can. And Gemma, feel free to chip in. But one of our um, delegates today has asked, in terms of Regulation 12.3, um, Regulation 12.3 does not enact mandatory vaccination in its plain English. Um, do you or do we agree that the provision is therefore an unlawful imposition on the registered person to invent that provision, albeit that we can't ignore the requirement? And I don't think I've got the, uh, the actual terms of the regulation in front. I don't, I don't know if you feel able to answer this on the spot, Paul, but... Well, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, just before I do that, Gemma was saying that visiting contractors could possibly be dealt with by ticking a box on the on the signing in book. What I would caution people to do is if you're going to adopt that policy, and I think it's a really good policy, make sure you do check. Don't mm. just get into the situation where there's a tick because the CQC inspector may ask you, did you see it? And if there's just a bunch of ticks, I mean, somebody could just tick it. So be careful that in CQC's language, they will need to be assured that the ticks are correct. Now, coming back to the more general question, I'm not going to speculate and I'm not going to answer in detail, but I think people should be very cautious. This is a very important public health policy. There are The vast majority of people are very happy to have the vaccine, are very happy that, that, will, that, it, will, that it will be there, and there are some people who don't want to have the vaccine. I think it would be very dangerous and very severe consequences, possibly for the future of a care home, if um, individual care home providers who perhaps shared the views of the anti-vaxxers were to seek legal routes to challenge the detail and the technical level of the legislation. Because if they are found to have flouted the law, if they are found to have placed people at risk, they will inevitably face the potential of enforcement action and maybe business destroying enforcement action. So whatever your views, Gemma said, this is the law, it has to be done. And I wouldn't be too keen artificially to try and split hairs, which are going to not, if you get, if you get enforcement action, which might end up um, before a high court judge in a judicial review or in front of a tribunal or in some enforcement action, which like a warning notice that may have a long-term effect, then it is not going to look very good from the care home's point of view, and it may lead to downgrading in ratings. If the CQC find regular non-compliance and regular reliance on what might be described as mm, illusory legal arguments, they may well downgrade to requires improvement or inadequate, and that will have a commercial impact because a lot of local authorities and NHS commissioners will not contract with such homes. So do be careful. Don't be encouraged and pushed into it by staff members who maybe encourage you to say, it doesn't apply to me, because look at this, look at, look, look at these wording. My lawyer, my trade union rep, whatever, says, says it's not properly drafted, so it doesn't apply. I would counsel against going down that route. It's that the potential damage is just far too great to risk becoming a sort of a, 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 an anti-vax hero. So do be careful and, and um, be aware of the consequences. Thanks, Lord. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for answering that, Paul. Yeah, just to pick up on that, I think it is very important um, to just remember that you know CQC will now be looking to take enforcement action, and now they say that they're going to do this on a proportionate basis. I mean, perhaps here at the firm, we might argue about how proportionate some of their enforcement action is, but what we have seen, and this is not to scaremonger, but there has been a real increase in enforcement action over recent months and even what Paul's talked about downgrading in ratings you'll all be aware that under CQC's new strategy they've removed the fixed reinspection timeframes. so if you are downgraded to requires improvement or at worst inadequate you don't actually know when CQC are going to be back out to reinspect. 
and you could be stuck with that rating for a very long time. CQC say they are only inspecting on the basis of risk at the moment. And that is also what we're seeing here. So just in the practical context that we're sitting in, in line with CQC strategy, which we've spoken about on previous webinars, which are on the website, um, I think it is important to make sure your house and your records are in order when it comes to mandatory vaccinations, so that when CQC come to inspect, it's not another area, or rather, even if they don't come to inspect, if you, you don't want to have concerns flagged by other agencies that might prompt them to come out to you as a risky service where you might risk that downgrade in ratings indefinitely. Um, I think that just about brings us to the end of the webinar. We have had a couple of the practical questions again, so I'll just reiterate. Yes, the slides and recording will be available after the webinar, even to virtual delegates. Everyone that's signed up will get a copy, but there is also a webinars section on our website where all of our previous webinars are over these COVID times, we've built up quite, hopefully quite a useful resource library, albeit they have to be taken as at the date um, when we ran them. You'll also get um, an opportunity to provide some feedback, which obviously we would really appreciate, not only um, for the feedback sake, but if there are any topics that you would like us to consider and um, to cover at future webinars, we're always keen to hear from you in our webinar programming. So please do, um, please do give us that kind of feedback, either through the forum or informally. Um, and finally, just a little plug for our social media channels. Um, you'll see details of all of our webinars, recent articles. We send out one article a month on topical issues. So if you're not already signed up to our Read Out report, you can do that via our website. Follow us on LinkedIn, also on Twitter, and we have a YouTube channel as well with some of our videos. So thank you to our presenters, Paul and Gemma. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us and staying on the webinar this morning. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Um, at a future webinar. Thanks a lot.